Battleground Productions presents Brass, the audio series, episode 33, Next Moves. The year is 1886, in a world whose history is very unlike our own. Here there is wireless communication, though only a handful of people know of its existence. Two of these people, Professor Eric von Hoffman and Lord Benjamin Brass, are currently communicating through experimental radio sets, and the Professor is now completing an alphanumeric code that he was instructed to use before speaking. 78-R-S-T-L-5. Received. Thank you, Eric. How are you, my friend? We've been told you were imprisoned in the Ministry of Science. I was until freed by our friend Ponder. Oh, what a marvel he is! Indeed. Now, Eric, I have only a brief time to speak as we're catching a train just past midnight, so we've already packed and are awaiting transport. A train? To where, my friend? Trieste, I think. Yes, Trieste, to begin with. Eric, what are you going to do next? Can you remain safe from the authorities? Oh! Yes, I believe so. I have friends throughout London who can offer me shelter. Trieste! Why Trieste? Well, we have a rather elaborate scheme to free our country from this awful Trent fellow, but it involves many meetings and, I dare say, a rather huge sum of capital. Eric, have you heard from anyone else than Ponder? Do you mean your family? Are they in London? Well, I... Oh, goodness. That's the cab below. We must make this train. Let us talk again, my friend, at 9 p.m. Greenwich time tomorrow. Can't we talk sooner? Well, there is so much that must be decided on our itinerary. After Trieste, Barcelona, perhaps, or Monaco? Or should we head straight to St. Petersburg? So many questions. So many timetables we must consult. Benjamin, what? It's the cause of all of this travel. I'll tell you when we talk tomorrow. Farewell, Eric. Farewell, my friend. Trieste, and what cab? I was lying, Mr. Grassley. The professor gave the wrong code. On the contrary, Abbott. He gave the right code so far as we're concerned. The message delivered was that my agent, I assume Ponder, is captured and that the person speaking is compromised and complicit. Though, how Ponder could be so fluent with our family code book is something of a miracle. Perhaps it wasn't Ponder who gave the code. You think that Gwendolyn might also be captured? We can't know until we hear from her. What we do know, however, is that we cannot trust von Hoffmann, though we must keep speaking with him. Why? It's always valuable to have a regular means of communicating with your enemy. And what's more, the life of our friend Ponder may very well depend on von Hoffmann or whoever he's working with, believing he's useful to them. Benjamin, if they know you're alive, We then... have even less time to prepare, yes. Hmm. Gentlemen, walk with me. Abed, have you had any luck with your contacts in the Laskers? Some. I will follow up with them immediately. Splendid. And I have another mission for you, my friend. How is your agent in Heidelberg? Effective, last time I checked. I have a new line of inquiry for him that must be made immediately. Mr. Grassley, where are we with our pilots and our craft? I have my concerns, Lord Brass. Which are? If we had an additional couple of weeks... Mr. Grassley, practically anything is possible with an additional two weeks. The trick is to use what time we have to its maximum effect. Yes, sir. What are your concerns? The French pilots? No, they're good enough, if a little cocky mm. and, well, French. <laughs> of course. Perhaps the companions of Obit. Mm. No, I will admit that when I met them, I was absolutely terrified. <laughs> With their turbans and scimitars, they look like brigands. I think they've occasionally pursued a bit of brigandry, but <laughs> usually in a good cause. It's... The ladies. The ladies? Mrs. Nation and Mrs. Gage. The aviatrix? I suppose that is what you would call them. And what are your concerns about the aviatrix? Are they not showing any facility in piloting their flivers? That's not the problem. In fact, both have had some experience in piloting airships and have taken to the flivver quite well. Mrs. Nation in particular shows a precision in our mock bombing runs that is 
frankly terrifying. <laughs> the woman is a warrior. Well, that's just it, Lord Brass. Is she? Are they? Are they what? Lord Brass, I believe that our cause is just, and I believe that this model of the fixed wing flivver, the number 27... Still haven't given it a name. Not yet. Perhaps we should call it the Grassley. After you. Thank you. <laughs> there is no need. I believe in my aircraft that they are as safe as design, materials, and fine factory engineering can make them. Mm -hmm. But they are still very dangerous and very difficult to pilot. What's more, what you are asking is to take these craft into battle. That is so. Lord Brass, these are women. What are we becoming if we are sending women into war? Uh, feminists? Please. Mr. Grassley, I believe every man should be the maker of his own destiny. And if I believe women are the equal of men and should be treated as such, it stands to reason to grant them the same fundamental right. Isn't it our duty as gentlemen to protect women from death and injury? This is a thorny point, Benjamin. My faith bids me give particular attention to the protection of women. Perhaps, but... Ah! The proper people to consult. Ladies! Hello! Uh, you see them there, Mr. Grassley? Do help me get their attention. Ladies! Hello, ladies! ladies. Uh, Mrs. Nation? Mrs. Gage? Hello there! Hello, gentlemen. And how are you? Very well, Mrs. Gage. Mrs. Nation! Lord Brass? Yes, we were on our way to the hangar to look over the flivvers before tomorrow's flights. She hasn't quite got the hang of the rudder bar yet. It can be tricky, particularly on steep curves. I've noticed. Well, I won't keep you from your work. I just have a brief question. All right. Are Mr. Grassley and I failing in our duties as gentlemen by allowing you to risk death, dismemberment, or worse in this endeavor? Lord Brass and Mr. Grassley... We have committed ourselves to your cause with the same unassailable bond which we have given our own of bringing slavery to an end. We believe in it enough to take lives and, if necessary, give our own. England must be freed of its enslavement just as assuredly as every man, woman, and child living in the southern states of America. We do not need your protection. And you need pilots. That's true, isn't it, Grassley? It is true that we have 30 craft completed and only 26 pilots. 28 with us. Mr. Grassley. Forgive any offense, ladies. I am pleased to have you in our unit. I apologize for my assumptions regarding your sex. And thank you for defying my assumptions of your sex by not being a jackass. Good evening. See you gentlemen tomorrow morning for training. <laughs> Good night, ladies. Good night, ladies. You know, I'm quite taken with just how practical Americans can be. It gives me a spark of hope for their troubled nation. Meanwhile, in the newly constructed velodome near Aberdeen, Lady Brass speaks with her trusted servants Millicent and Mrs. Drake about their newly arrived guests. How are the royal couple settling in, Millicent? Oh, it's wonderful what troopers they are. The royal consort, bless him, still has a something of a cold, but Margaret is looking after him. And the queen, oh, mum, I'd swear she's having the time of her life. She says she hasn't had this much excitement since her visit to Calcutta and keeps wanting to know what's next. As do I. Mum? I will confide to you ladies that while the rescue of our monarchs was a resounding success, I've run into a bit of a quandary regarding what we shall do next. Concealment here at the velodrome is not only risky to their safety, but to our endeavor. Have you considered escaping by sea, ma'am? I have, Drake. Certainly the easiest solution. It will be at least a day before the government manages to post sentries at all ports, I would imagine. Yet, escape to where? The continent, I should think. Oh, their highnesses could certainly seek refuge in the court of any number of their children or grandchildren. If necessary, they could even set up a court in exile, I suppose. Yet, I can't help but think that it is more to their advantage, and to ours, for them to remain in Britain. Certainly it does my art good to think of them here. These are good people, the Scots. 
Uh, we'd have no shortage of volunteers to hide them, whether in crowded city or remote village. I do not doubt their loyalty to their sovereign, yet I question the wisdom of entrusting them to a volunteer corps of civilians. One weak link in the chain and all collapses. As we learned from Danny. No, I've been thinking, now that we have the king and the queen, we might as well bring them to the chessboard. And the board is? London. <gasps> you want to take their majesties back to London? That sounds... Uh, counterintuitive, I would wager. Barmy! Sorry, Mum. Never apologise for your honest reaction, Millicent. It does indeed have a touch of lunacy to it, ma'am. More than a touch. Yet, given the ramshackle nature of Benjamin's characteristically elaborate plan, I've always felt that it could use something of a royal proclamation. Revolution as sanctioned by the royal majesties. Precisely. Still, Lord Brass's plan does seem to risk great violence and upheaval in the capital. What can we do to safeguard their security? We know the trains will be watched, and most likely the roads as well. I have little doubt that if necessary we could still smuggle them past whatever run-of-the-mill troops the government has deployed. But there is another option. Which is? We take them with us. Drake, your thoughts? <sighs> While I worry slightly about the health of the royal consort, I think he'd be up for the journey, and I suspect Her Majesty would be thrilled. All right, then. Let's sit them down for a chat over tea. It's always best to set a mood of calm and reflection before embarking on a death-defying adventure. Later that evening, in a dark room in the heart of an evil rookery, the Crime Minister confers with his trusted lieutenant. O'Leary. Crime Minister. A report on affairs in Scotland, if you please. Our agents are still interrogating the household staff, but thus far with no results. Everyone in the palace seems to have a different theory as to what's happened and where they might be. That's too convenient. Loyalty to the Crown runs deep in the British serving class. Monarchism is such a tiresome flavour of patriotism. Is the news of their disappearance public yet? We've kept it out of the papers, but servants swim in gossip. They do. Hold them under guard until they dry out. Who knows, maybe one or more will get dry enough to crack. What else are you doing to find our missing royals? We've stationed additional guards at all train stations and are placing sentries at all ports north of the River Tweed. And next? It's... Possible they might be staying with sympathizers somewhere in the countryside. Ah, the rural folk. The people particularly given to gossip. They want to spy in every pub, in every market, in every gathering of more than three provincial clodhoppers, lubies, or pumpkins. Someone knows something. And when money doesn't work, perhaps it has been too long since the Scots have had reason to fear the English. For an operation that size, I'll need reinforcements. Get them through Trent. Let's say an emergency acquisition of 500 soldiers. Yes, sir. And what should I call this mission? A hunt and retrieval exercise. Very good, Crime Minister. I don't need to impress upon you what it means to have Victoria and Albert out and away from the security of our custody. Why, anything could happen to them. They might have been captured by anarchists or revolutionaries intent on using our most sacred monarchs for their own nefarious ends. It's a dangerous situation we're trying to rescue them from, sir. It is, yes. And who knows if we'll be successful. It would be a national tragedy if they were both to be killed in a failed rescue attempt. I will keep the major of the company we send appraised that this might be an outcome. Anything else? I assume you would give me any updates on the matter of our missing scientist. We've sent men out to his home, and even now we're knocking on doors of every Serbian in the city. The police? Every station has a photograph. It's just a matter of time, sir. Let us hope so. He is extremely dangerous. 
not much of a threat to look at, if you don't mind me saying, sir. Thin fellow with that sweet little moustache. Mr. Nikola Tesla is one of the most dangerous men in the Empire. And it's not due to the size of his muscles, but the expanse of his brain. We need him. You can put your trust in me, Crime Minister. You know, O'Leary, I believe I can. In addition to a ruthlessness rare for your sex, you have one great quality over your predecessor, the late Mr. Crawford. Yes, sir. Your success rate. He failed me in his efforts to kill the Brass family. You've not failed me yet in any fashion. The Brass family are alive. Oh, indeed, I learned of this surprising development just last evening. What does that mean for us, sir? Complications, no doubt. The first being that I must discover where they are. And how can you do that, sir? It's a puzzle. How to locate the position of a wireless transmitter. I shall give this my attention. As to the rest, I will be relying on you to bring me thorough and regular reports with a particular eye to anomalies. Anomalies? Well, no doubt Benjamin has been preparing his game for months while well, I have been busied with the light task of running the Empire. Oh well. You can't step twice into the same river, as Heraclitus says. What's that, sir? Uh, Reimagining the past is useless. Time goes in one direction always, O'Leary, and so must we. Uh, one last item. Has the equipment arrived? This morning. Have it installed while I'm out? Yes, sir. That is all. Thank you, Crime Minister. But as O'Leary begins up the stairs from the dark basement, she hears voices from above. I told you the Crime Minister's not receiving visitors without an appointment. I'm not a visitor, you lumpish oaf. I'm Vincent Law. What's the trouble? Ah, Miss O'Leary. I simply must see the Crime Minister immediately. Not possible, Mr. Law. His visiting hours have ended for the day. But you don't understand. If you'd like to plead your case, you have the length of time it'll take me to get to the street to hail a cab. I've got a very full itinerary. Uh, very well. Last night, after the monthly lottery, I was following up on a rather sinister chap whom I'd seen indoors. I had him at bay with my walking stick revolver when a man stepped out of the shadows calling my name. I turned to look at him and the cad I'd been following walloped me across the noggin with a set of brass knuckles. It all sounds very lively. Are you looking for recompense of some sort? No, it's this. The man who stepped out of the shadows was Mr. Crawford. What? Are you sure? As sure as the lurch in the 13th hand of a game of whist. I have no idea what that means. Now, don't you think this is information that would be valuable to your boss? I do, and I thank you for it. I relay it to him directly. Don't you think he'd be a little more inclined to believe me if I told him myself? Mr. Law, you are not the best advocate for your own veracity. What? Oh, I'm not saying I don't believe you, but trust me, it's much better for this news to come from me. It's bound to infuriate him. Infuriate? Have you ever seen what his face looks like when he's infuriated? Truth is, I've never seen his face. Not many people have. More than once. Well, if you wouldn't mind passing on this news... I shall. And Mr. Law, I'd suggest that you speak to no one else about this. Perhaps you remember the Chinese curse? Can't say I do. May you come to the attention of important people. As the chief agent to the most dangerous man in London steps up and into her cab, she leaves a shaken Vincent Law. And for the first time in his life, the fashionable crime lord seeks the comfort of London's anonymity 
pulling the collar of his cloak up as he hurries away. What will be the consequences of his revelation? And what of Lord Brass's still-to-be-deciphered master plan? Shall it indeed be revolution by appointment to Her Majesty? Find out more about these and other pressing issues when we next join the adventures of the First Family of the Realm. Brass. Brass is manufactured by Battleground Productions and features Kate Cray as Lady Brass, Charles Leggett as Lord Brass, Catherine Grant Sutty as Gwendolyn Brass, and Jeremy Adams as Cyril Brass, with Larry Albert, Dennis Bateman, Margie Bickman, Lisa Carswell, Amy Decker, Nancy Fry, Ronnie Hill, Philip Keeman, John Longenbaugh, Matt Middleton, Terry Edward Moore, Tad Morgan, Pam Nolte, and Nikki Vissel. Brass was recorded at Jack Straw Studios, engineered by Joel Maddox, with sound design by Kirsty Gilmore, and music composed by Bruce Monroe. It was written and directed by John Longenbaugh. For more information on Brass, go to battlegroundproductions.org. Find us on Facebook and Instagram, and to support us, fund us on Patreon, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. <laughs>